All right. Well, let's see. Let's go ahead and get started and we'll do some intros. I am Laura Petrolino. I am the marketing director here at NDTC, and I am so excited to be moderating this panel with these three amazing trainers of ours. You know, it's, I have to say, there's not many better ways to spend a, what is it, Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, who knows what day it is. It doesn't matter what day it is. There's not a better evening that I would want to spend than with these trainers talking about staffer secrets. And that's what we're here for today. So, you know, October is all about really digging into campaign staffers. And that is because it is what I call Staff Academy season. Um, and Staff Academy, for those of you who don't know, is our 10 week cohort program that is designed to recruit, train, and connect new staffers to paid career opportunities in democratic politics across the country. So if you are really looking to work on a campaign in a paid position in 2022, Staff Academy is the program for you. It is one of our absolute just favorite programs here because it is a amazing intense learning experience but it is also just a great community and all of these trainers have had played a, a role in staff academy so i'm sure you'll hear a little bit about them along the way tonight when inviting applicants to join the program we prioritize leaders who are women people of color and transgender and non-binary people um and we really just are excited to meet. We always get so excited each year to meet our new cohort of Staff Academy graduates because they become part of the NDTC family. And it is so fun to just watch, to follow these careers um, along their journey, just to become all-star campaign staffers in a variety of different roles and positions across the country. So if you are looking to grow or launch your career in politics, definitely check out Staff Academy. The applications open October 18th for our 2022 cohort. And we're here today really to help you think through what it is like to be a campaign staffer. And all of these folks here, they have walked the walk, they've talked the talk, they've been in the good and the bad of it, and are going to share with you what they wish they knew when they were starting out. So it's kind of one of those great opportunities uh, to, to hear from the source what you should be thinking through right now when you're at the beginning. And um, a couple of things before I turn it over to them and let them introduce themselves. We have a Q&A box, so please throw your questions in there. We want this to be really interactive and we wanna get your questions answered. So throw them in there. Um, Ali and myself will be watching it. Ali is gonna be answering some of the questions in the chat and throwing in some resources. So pay attention to that. And, um, and we're here to, to get your questions answered and have a great conversation with you about campaign staff for life. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our great trainers um, and have them introduce themselves. Why don't we, we will go in alphabetical order um, because that feels so official. So Cal, why don't I start with you? Yeah, thanks, Laura. I am so excited. It's Staff Academy season again. Um, my name is Cal Jack Cade. My pronouns are they, them. And um, Laura already mentioned that we've got a lot of Texans in the webinar tonight. I am born and raised from Northeast Texas, just outside of Tyler. Um, went to school at the University of Texas at Austin and really cut my teeth in Texas politics, working in and around the state capitol for both members of the legislature as well as folks um, involved in various political fights in the state capitol. Um, I really got my start in communications and digital work. Um, I worked in the press office for Congressman Mark D.C. Um, out of the DFW area. Um, and also uh, worked at a public affairs communications and digital firm here in Washington, D.C., where I'm currently placed, paced, based, not placed. Um, and I'm really excited to be here because I was actually uh, got my first sort of taste of Staff Academy earlier this year as a trainer and facilitator for um, 
part of Staff Academy towards the end of the program, there is a weekend long portion of the program where we really um, spend all weekend diving into various different topics of Staff Academy. And it's an opportunity for members of Staff Academy to present um, some of their final campaign plans that they've been working on throughout the Academy over the several months of the program. So I'm really excited to be talking to folks who are potentially going to be part of Staff Academy again. Please apply if it's something that you're interested in. It's truly one of the best uh, most intensive trainings you can really be a part of in this space. And I think the, the final thing I'll say is that, you know, I really come to politics as someone who, you know, I grew up in a very rural area. My hometown is a town of 2,000 people. There are more cows than people. Um, and I also come to this work as a trans and non-binary person who, when I started working in politics and, you know, still to this day, there aren't enough people like me in, in rooms where decisions are made, where uh, in positions of power, in elected office, in, in staffer positions. And I come at this work as someone who wants to change that and want to see more people like me and people who don't look like me, who still are not represented in the way that they should be among the ranks of political staff in the Democratic Party. So I would really encourage you, if you are someone who doesn't see yourself in um, rooms where decisions are made or positions of power, to seek out opportunities like this, because we need you. We're a stronger party when um, we are a diverse and inclusive one, and I just really hope to continue seeing um, the way the way that our staff looks changes and bringing more people into the process and into these paid positions. So excited to talk with y'all tonight. Thank you so much for that, Cal. Uh, Dennis, why don't we hop over to you? <clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name's Dennis, he, him pronouns. I'm uh, checking in from my um, hometown or homeland area of sunny Southern California on the outskirts of LA. And just to give a brief background about myself, uh, I was born and raised in Southern California. I decided to torture myself and I went to Ithaca for undergrad um, and the brutal winters there, um, they did a toll on me for a little bit, but it was a good, good learning experience. I uh, majored in industrial and labor relations from Cornell University. From there, I had a really unique idea. I don't think it's ever been done before. I moved to the Bay Area to launch a startup. And uh, after that, it did not pan out. I ended up working in the tech scene for a little bit. Then the madness of 2016 happened. And I thought, you know, this country seems to be burning to the ground a little bit right now. It's probably best if I get more involved in politics at the moment. And from there, I found myself working in some local San Francisco races. I also worked with Fight for the Future a small digital rights um, privacy nonprofit. And uh, from there, I actually was in the first round of the Staff Academy program, which was an absolute blast. Um, so yeah, if you have any like specific questions about Staff Academy, feel free to type in the chat box and I'll try to get back to you on my personal experience. But I did that program, I had a ton of fun, met a lot, bunch of friends. From there, I worked with the DCCC as a digital strategist um, for incumbents in the House trying to win re-election in Trump-heavy districts. And I've also worked with the National Democratic County Organization for Digital Strategy. And um, I try to, I'm a little bit of a hybrid. I'm also a painter and that's why I'm in the LA area. So I paint a lot and show some art, try to do a bit of a back and forth be between art and politics. And I'm working with the um, NDTC as a trainer at the moment. Um, and I guess I just want to say that Things are like very chaotic and very solemn in some ways, but um, I guess the so little finger is my favorite character in Game of Thrones. And I've always liked his quote, the chaos is a ladder. So I feel like as chaotic as things are, there is a bright side to that, which is that in some circumstances we can act enact a lot of change in a very quick way if we play our cards right. So if you're feeling down, I think uh, there is reason to be optimistic. Hopefully anyways, I am an optimist. So that's my viewpoint anyways. And uh, it's, now or never to get involved in politics. Absolutely, thank you so much, Dennis. And let's go to Sean. I love these pep right. talks along the way too. This is great. <laughs> um, hi y'all, my name is Sean Carlson. I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, I am hailing you uh, just outside of Washington, DC. Um, I, am, I live in my hometown. It's not how I thought this was gonna work out. Um, there's two things that you should know about me that are important to, to my story. One, uh, I'm queer, 
And two, I went to school for a bass trombone performance. I have multiple degrees in trombone performance uh, that I am totally not using, much to my mother's chagrin. Um, and I am really sitting here tonight because uh, when I was in graduate school, actually a little bit before that, but when I came out of the closet, coming out was a, was a political awakening for me, but I really had nothing to do with that with my, you know, living, sitting in a conservatory. So one day I filled out a form on mybarackobama.com and to my complete and utter shock, uh, someone called me the very next day and said, we are starting a, a, a group on your campus and would you wanna to come to this meeting? And I was so shocked that somebody actually checked that that I was like, absolutely, I'm absolutely coming to that meeting. I went, they said, well, there's three of you. So does anyone wanna lead this? And I was like, I got time. Uh, so I did. Um, and I, that was really my uh, jumping off point in, into politics. Um, I have been obsessed with digital ever since uh, because I was lucky enough to um, be the recipient of some, some digital training very early on in my career that helped me connect those dots and uh, helped me realize that I could be the person that makes those forms that gives someone else their, their start in politics. Um, and ever since uh, I have been using the internet to make social change in pretty much every context you can. I've done labor organizing, I've worked with celebrities, I've worked on political campaigns, uh, candidates, I've been a consultant, I've been in house, I've worked with nonprofits, I've done a lot over my career. Um, but my very, very, my very favorite thing that I get to do um, is training and be in these spaces. Um, a, because I was the recipient of that, that kind of knowledge sharing and confidence booster at a critical time in my life, and B, because it's just really fun to be in these spaces and learn and share and, and grow together. Um, I'm also particularly proud in the last couple of years of my, uh, my work with Staff Academy. I've been a, a coach and trainer for Staff Academy the last two years. Uh, it's my absolute favorite thing I do all year. I plan my whole year around this. Um, and it is uh, a really, really incredible program that um, you know I've gotten so much personal joy out of participating in and also seeing a lot of people get um, you know, their start, uh, just like I did at, at one point in time. So I'm super, super glad to be here with you all tonight and talk about my very, very subject, which is starting a career in politics from scratch. Thank you. You know, what I love about hearing all of your stories is that so often I think people feel like they have to have a background or a family that's been in politics, or they have to have a, an in or no people. And I love hearing your stories because from trombones to startups, to painting, like you are all people who said, you know what, a change needs to be made and I'm here to make it. And that was really the only requirement that you had in your background that you needed to, to come on this journey. So I think that's so important for everyone here listening to remember is that it doesn't matter if you've had a 30 year career doing something totally different. It doesn't matter if you are just starting out and you have a degree in something that has nothing to do with politics. If you care about your community and making change, you can do it. And that's what's great about programs like Staff Academy is because we are really here to support you along that way. And to Cal's point, to really bring a more representative campaign community because that's what makes us stronger. Um, so with that, let's talk about really what those key traits of campaign staffers are that you all have seen really make a staffer stand out above and beyond um, and help them propel their career forward. Maybe, Cal, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I would say one of the biggest and most important traits for a successful campaign staffer and something that I've really tried to take hold of and keep in mind in any job or any campaign situation I've been in is to not be afraid to just jump in and get it done and figure it out. So often, really all the time, campaigns are an all hands on deck kind of situation. There is always a fire. There is always something that is pulling folks attention. And oftentimes, unless you're on a really large, you know, like presidential or like statewide race, there are never enough hands. Um, you rely on volunteers, you rely on staff from other departments. And so it's not uncommon for staffers to be asked to do something that maybe they haven't done before, or maybe they don't have experience doing, or maybe is outside of your job description. And my advice would be to really just jump in and figure it out as best that you can, whether it's something that you've done or not. I think people really do take notice of that. They take notice of people who are willing to just do it 
and get it done because more than likely if someone's asking you to do something that you haven't done before it's because they don't have anyone else to do it and they can't do it and they just need someone to handle it so i would just really encourage folks to try and lean in to the discomfort it can be really uncomfortable doing things that you haven't done before but be a team player jump in figure it out as much as you can love it that is such great advice uh sean let's hop over to you yeah so reflecting back on my my, my career i think the thing that i would have um wanted someone to tell me and believe right at the very beginning was um, and this quote is often attributed to Maya Angelou, but I don't, it's dubious whether she actually said it, but nobody remembers uh, what you said. They remember how you made them feel. Um, and that applies uh, particularly in, in our world. Um, you know, reflecting back on, on my time in politics, I think the biggest successes I've had have been on teams where, you know, I've approached the work with empathy and kindness, even when things are, are always um, a, a five alarm fire, because they frequently are. Um, and the folks that I have grown to, to respect the most, um, you know, A, they know how to do the work, but I think that that's only one part of it. I think it really matters how you do the work and how you make people feel along the way. Um, most of the opportunities that I've, that I've been given throughout my career happened because not only because, do I know how to do the things that I know how to do very well, um, but I have built and cultivated strong relationships with people by being a, an, an ethical um, kind person who you want to be around, especially um, in, a, in a high stress environment. Um, and commensurate with that, I think also, um, you know, being the person in the room when things are stressful, who does not get stressed out um, is, a, is a, a, a fabulous quality to have in anybody who's going to work in politics. Um, there, I cannot tell you how many times, um, you know, there have been countdown clocks and things like have to be done, like, you know, in, in two hours that you never thought you could do in two hours. Uh, and and you know, being able to be the person who just kind of has that on lockdown. And I love what, what Cal said. I usually say my favorite line is it's handled. And I think that's also a great quality to have. Just, you know, I've got this and you know, kind of lower the temperature when everyone else is is losing their minds. Those people stand out to me. And campaigns are a constant five alarm fire for sure. So being able to just navigate that and and make take those alarms down a few notches is always a benefit. Uh, Dennis, let's let's throw it over to you. What would you add to this? Yeah, um, first I want to um, piggy bank off of uh, Cal's answer a little bit and uh, agree that when I switched initially from the startup scene, to politics, I was kind of surprised by how similar they are in some ways, especially like a small campaign where um, there's a ton of opportunities. If you want to do something or if you say you're doing field work right now and you want to start doing digital stuff, if you just start doing it or ask someone like, can I help? The answer will almost always be yes. Like they're almost always understaffed. There is a vast amount of opportunity for you to change. And I think it's kind of best almost um, especially for smaller campaigns have like a Swiss army mentality, a Swiss army knife mentality, and just try to learn as many different traits as you can. Um, I guess for my, my personal tidbit, which kind of feeds into um, Sean's answer a little bit too, which makes sense. We're kind of all giving a little bit of similar answers. Um, this may just be the Southern Californian in me. And I know this is easier said than done, but I feel like if you can kind of have a little bit of a Zen like approach to being a campaign, we're just like, accept like nothing is going to go according to plan. Uh, it is, there's going to be mistakes. Uh, deadlines are going to be missed. All of a sudden new deadlines with like hours to go are going to be created. And I think for your own mental well-being, especially if you want to be in this in the long run, it is really good to try to just accept that things are going to be changing constantly throughout the day and throughout the month. And uh, the sooner you can try to come to terms with that, the happier you will be working in a uh, campaign life. Yes, very, very true. So I think agility, proactiveness, being the person that always has a plan, uh, if we could kind of like filter that down, those are the, the three big traits that you all really touched upon, uh, which, is, which is great. Let's, so people that right now, they wanna be involved in 2022 campaigns, but they're looking about what they can do right now to start getting involved, start developing experience. So they are ready or they're cultivating those skills. So when it's time, when it's go time, when campaigns are hiring, um, which a lot of them will be really soon, what makes them more attractive? What would you say 
are the one or two things that right now new or aspiring campaign staffers can do to start getting that experience and really understanding what campaign life is like? Uh, Dennis, we'll start with you. Yeah, so one of the great things about working in politics is one of the only kind of occupations where you can immediately start volunteering and learning on the job as you go. There's not very many things where if you, you want to work in business or if you want to be like a psychologist, you can't just like show up on one day and be like, hey, where do I volunteer to learn how to do this? Um, and so that's awesome um, that you can do it in, in politics. So I would say for people that want to get involved immediately um, to first pay attention to local races in your area, the smaller the campaign is, the more opportunities you're going to have, the more they're going to welcome you with open arms um, and just immediately have you start helping out. And you can learn a lot like in a quick period of time. And politics is like immensely personal. So every, every friend that you make, every connection that you form um, on each campaign will be many more opportunities and doorways to further campaigns down the line. And I would also just say, um, in addition to that, um, just start showing up. Like there's, there's local like political clubs and like every area. Uh, if you live in a big city area, there's like, I mean, you can have it be a full-time job just going to different political clubs and events all the time. Um, so I would just have, I would say uh, for people to start doing that too. Um, and it'll also be fun. I mean, you'll make friends uh, working on campaigns and in politics is a lot more fun and a lot easier if you have like a group of friends that you kind of like look forward to talking to and hanging out with. So that'd be my, my main advice. Awesome. Cal, what would you add? Yeah, in addition to volunteering, like Dennis is absolutely right, there's always a campaign, there is always someone to be volunteering for, making calls for, knocking doors for, what have you. I would say, especially if you're someone who's interested in a communications or digital role, like start building out a portfolio, like whether it is like getting on canva.com for free and just like working up some graphics or, you know, even like mocking up some stuff for like a fake candidate or a real candidate um even putting together kind of like a writing you know writing samples and and doing some like practice writings even like this is a little bit it's a little bit analog but like even writing some like letters to the editor and submitting them to your local newspaper and stuff like that like those are things that you're going to have to do as a digital and or communication staffer and when you're applying for these jobs like usually folks like they want to see that you've done that work already that you've at least got some experience, some idea of what you're doing, right? Even if there's room for growth and room to learn. So I would say start building a portfolio if that feels relevant to the type of jobs that you're going to be applying for. I love that. That's such a great idea. And, you know, it's important to remember everyone that 2021, even if there's not big elections in your state or in your, your area, like there's a ton of local little elections all over the country. And to Dennis's point, those are the campaigns that really could use your help. And also a lot of them that you can really start from the beginning being very actively involved in the actual doing. So think about that. And also, even if you're, you know, you there's not a campaign you want to get involved in, there's not many elections going on, there's always issues. There's issues, there's ballot measures. So to Cal's point, like writing letters to the editor, um, looking and figuring out what local organizations are driving some of those issues and seeing if you can do some call time, get on phones, do some, get people to the polls, do some vote tripling, like lots of stuff like that that are opportunities for you to get involved and build up that portfolio in a lot of different ways. It doesn't, don't think just like, well, if I can't work on a, you know, a state congressional campaign, I can't do anything. Like you can do everything. There's always ways to be politically involved. Um, and with that, Sean, I want to, we have a lot of questions in the chat about what positions people should think about starting with when they're like looking to volunteer or looking to, you know, help out small campaigns. So what would you say are some of those roles that people should, would be great, like very entry level roles to get their first taste? That is a wonderful question. Um, so obviously I'm biased because I love using the internet uh, for, for, um, <laughs> for, for this, but I think, you know, getting a start in, in digital is a great way of getting sort of your hands on, on a lot of different things in the campaign. You'll work with comms, you'll work on fundraising, you'll, you'll work with field. Um, the most common trajectory for, for folks in politics is to start with some kind of field position. That seems to be almost everyone I know has, has kind of 
started out in that way. And that's usually because those are the places where people need in regular times, not pandemic times, where people need the most kind of, um, you know, kind of help, uh, like knocking doors, being, being an, an organizer. Um, you know, to, to, the, to y'all's point about volunteering as well, I think what people love on the other end of being the recipient of volunteer power is for you to be very specific about your skills, to come with a, with a set of skills, right? Because you might have a room of 10 people and they all kind of, not everyone can, can like get stuff envelopes, right? But the person who comes in and says, I know how to code, or I actually had, I, I ran my college's, uh, I don't know, PR club. And I've, you know, I've pitched local reporters for this art show that I did, right? So I'd be leading with the skills that you already have and not being intimidated to say, you know, you actually do have that relevant background. You'd be shocked how many people start in these, in these kinds of jobs, myself included, um, that might not necessarily have that relevance. Like not every, all of us have a poli-sci degree, right? So, um, you know, those entry-level jobs or volunteer opportunities, I think, seek out the ones that give you the most kind of balcony view on the campaign. Also, where you can leverage your specific uh, skills if, if you have them. Um, but also don't be afraid to just take the person that comes along as well. And if it's not right, I mean, you know, I started off as a field organizer. I'm super great at that because I like I like walking and I like talking to people. But I never thought that I'd be, you know, sitting behind a computer all day. Um, but here I am and I found my way into that and loved it. So it, my, my other piece of advice is don't trip if the first thing you're doing is not the thing you do forever. You know, you will you will have many opportunities to iterate throughout your career and, and do other things. Love that. Uh, Cal, Dennis, anything you'd add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with everything that Sean said. I also um, started off as field as basically everyone seems to, and I'm also doing digital now. So um, don't, I, I, I would just say also, um, like, don't be super stressed out about where you start. You can always like switch. It's not not set in stone that you have to do this forever if you start off in one area and then you want to make a transition. Yeah, that's great advice. Can we actually talk a little bit about the field starting spot? Because I know that is someplace a lot of people start um, and often, you know, get stressed out or struggle to get, get from field into a more advanced role. What would be some of your pieces of advice or thoughts around that transition? Because I know that is a stumbling block that, that a lot of people feel feel kind of stuck. They love field, but they want to do more. Um, I'll jump in really quick there of just think about the skills that you develop as an organizer and how they transfer to the other things, the other kinds of departments, the other kind of work that you want to do. And more than likely, there is something that can transfer because you really do do it all as a field organizer. You've got to learn how to talk to people. You've got to build relationships. You have to be, you know, you have to know your scripts. You have to be really thoughtful about what you're saying at the doors. You're training volunteers on how to knock doors. You know, as a comms professional, if I'm sitting in an interview, interviewing someone for a comms, you know, job, and I hear that, you know, I see that they're an organizer. There are so many things that they can talk about in terms of like remembering their scripts, knowing talking points, knowing how to draft those talking points and stick to them, knowing how to train people. A lot of the times comms folks have to train their principals, media train them, make sure that they're prepped for interviews and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, whether it's comms or digital or data or anything else, really think about how those experiences, what you're learning, the work that you're doing can transfer to the role that you are applying for. I would really encourage folks to make a list, like whether it's, you know, your bullet points on your resume or a longer list in your journal or whatever, and compare that to the position description of the job that you're applying for and see where you can connect the dots, right? See where you can draw direct lines to and emphasize that both in your, you know, your cover letter, but also in interviews that you have for those positions. It's great advice. And that actually kind of speaks to Richard just put a question in the Q&A box about um, if you have other relevant experience from another profession in those area in areas, how to make that lateral shift over to campaign staff position. Um, so Richard, I think what Cal said applies directly to that as well. Um, likewise, we have a lot of people I've noticed in the chat who are coming from other careers. Sean, Dennis, is there any other advice that you would add to what Cal said to help them make that transition from like a really successful career someplace else that they can apply those same skills? Yeah, I think, well, um, 
the, the, the obvious uh, sort of entryway and jumping over to those things is to get some sort of professional accreditation. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that that's what we're all doing here tonight to talk to you about. Staff Academy is a great resource for that. Um, there are also other, um, you know, uh, accreditations programs you can get into from digital to take that experience that you might have and also add that sort of imprimatur of like, okay, I've gone to this institution and I took a six week coding course or I have an, a, a media planning certification, right? Um, and then also I saw in the, in the Q&A that there's somebody asked like, how do you navigate times between cycles? And that's also a great time to level up those skills. That's what people look for on a resume. So if I have two resumes in front of me, they both have field organize, organizing experience, but somebody has said, you know, I've, I've taken a six week coding boot camp and I know how to do you know, this, that's just an example. Uh, but I think getting leveling up on those hard skills um, to, to pair with your already excellent background and experience and who you are as a human being, I think gives you a leg up. That's great. Yeah, I, I agree um, a lot with what Sean's saying with accreditation. One thing um, when I when I kind of changed laterally from the more like tech world to the political campaign world, um, I didn't have that and at first. And um, I, I found it was almost a little frustrating because I thought at the beginning I was kind of starting off like at the very entry level when like I personally thought I could be doing something a little bit higher up. And part of that was just like the nature of the game because um, no one like knew me that well. I, I was like new to the scene. And um, so that's, that's how I started off doing field work. Um, but there's, I guess there's something to be said for something, for doing something a little like outside of your initial professional area too, because everything's symbiotic um, in politics. And I feel like I learned a lot doing field work that then translated into being even stronger on the digital side when I went back to that. So if you don't have accreditation, um, you can also just pretty quickly go up um, the totem pole if, you, um, if you're feeling a little frustrated by going in an entry level area. Awesome, this is all great advice. Okay, so let's say you were talking to your initial baby intro campaign staff herself, and you were giving you were giving yourself one really key piece of advice. What would that piece of advice be? Uh, and Sean, let's start with you. And you could make it musical. You could play your piece of advice on the trombone. Just tie it all together and use those skills because your mom would be proud. I'm worried that you might not know how that instrument works, but yes, I will tend to, <laughs> to do that. Um, oh gosh, okay. So I think the biggest piece of advice I would I would like to have had at the very beginning um, is that 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 you actually can do this. That there are that um, this world is is super intimidating. There's a lot of very smart people in it. Um, there's also people um, who aren't as talented as you are when you when you're starting out, right? Not everybody has this wealth of knowledge and experience and, and talent that they're just sitting on that you're not aware of, right? Um, and you're not necessarily behind the ball from the very beginning. Um, I probably still need to give me that advice like last week, Sean, but I think that's a like an ongoing uh, challenge that all of us face, um, especially if you don't, you know, didn't get the, the traditional start in politics like, like some folks did. Um, so I think, yeah, the biggest piece of advice I would have is, is uh, calm down and um, that, you know, there's, you know, when you're building a career for the, for the long term, um, there are always going to be more opportunities. There's always ways to kind of bounce back from things and, and meet people and, and learn and grow. And there's just so many things to do now that there weren't like 11, 12 years ago, that this world is just so big. And there's so many things to do that, that I think, you know, there's just so much opportunity and we need so much help. So just, don't freak out. If you want to do this, there's plenty of room for you too. Love it. We need so much help. So much help. Uh, Cal, let's hand it over to you. Yeah, I feel like this really kind of works in tandem with, with what Sean said of like, you can do it, is also do, don't let fear hold you back because more often than not, taking a risk in politics pays off. And I've seen it a million and a half times. If it feels scary, think about why it feels scary, whether it's a job or a type of job or moving to a place or what have you. Think about why that might feel scary and determine if whether or not like that is a good reason to choose not to do something. More often than not, like particularly if you were shifting fields coming into this um, as someone who doesn't have a background working professionally in politics, it can feel really scary for a lot of the reasons that Sean mentioned of just like 
feeling like there are people who have done this longer or feeling like there are folks that have some secret knowledge that you don't. In the end, like a lot of that is that is fear and a lot of that is is very much rooted in things that especially if you're um, if you are someone who comes, you know, is queer or trans or black or indigenous, a person of color, like those are things that are also in that are socialized into our brains that we are not enough, that we do not bring enough to the table. And those are lies that other people tell us because you fully are equipped, just like Sean said, to do this. And I would just really say, don't let fear hold you back. Um, do the thing that feels right to you and feels rewarding to you, no matter how big or small. We've talked all throughout this panel about you know, it doesn't need to be a big flashy like statewide campaign. Really the place that we need the most help are the local campaigns. Like they are, those are the places where we really need energy and we need good members of staff. And that can feel scary. That can feel like a risk for all kinds of reasons. Um, so I would just encourage folks to take the risk, do the scary thing if it still feels safe to you and don't get in your own way. Love it. That's such great advice. We so often think about what will happen if we do something, but we don't think about what will happen if we don't do something. Uh, and when it comes to politics, that's both for you and for your community. So that's great advice. Dennis, how about you? Uh, yeah, I agree with everyone's thoughts on trying not to be intimidated. And for me, it was also a bit of a unique kind of experience where um, ignoring the the professional component on being intimidated on whether you have the correct skill set or not for me one of the most daunting things was when i first got involved in local races everyone was just throwing out all of these names and abbreviations for laws and i had like no idea what anyone was talking about it was like another language um and i, I caught on very quickly so if if you find that's an issue like you will start to recognize these names very quickly and just give it like a week or two um it will you it'll get a lot better than that first day um, I guess as for like the it, the one tip of advice I would uh, piece of advice I would tell myself if I had to do it again would be to follow open doors. Um, you you have like your heart set on a certain like candidate or congressional race, but there's another. Um, you have a friend on a campaign who's saying to come join them, or you're getting another campaign reaching out to you. Campaign cycles are short; like it will be over before you know it, and you'll have all that experience, and then you can kind of go back um, to your initial goal if you still even want it. Then you may have changed your mind and be on a different track at that point. But uh, since everything is so personal, um, I feel like it's best to just kind of go where, go to the place where they want you the most, and you'll probably have a good time. I love it. That's such great advice. Um, you know, we have a question from Anthony in here about actually hiring campaign staffers. So a little bit on the other side of the coin, what advice do you all have for Anthony about hiring dedicated and effective staffers for his campaign? Anyone? Um, I'll jump in there. And this is kind of a, a theme of something we've talked about with lots of people who are joining us that are getting involved in politics, you know, maybe professionally for the first time or making a career shift. I really do believe that diversity of experience really does strengthen staff. It strengthens our staff pipeline. It, it builds better campaigns because there is a problem in politics where it is a lot of people who have done this for decades or have done this for a long time where it's the only type of thing they've ever done professionally. And there is a sense of kind of like losing touch with some of those other things that like can be supplemented by experiences that people bring in, whether it is from a professional perspective or even lived experiences that th those experiences can take all kinds of different shapes. But, you know, I in in hiring folks like I always try and keep an eye out for the more like non traditional applicants right like people who have had service jobs who have worked in other industries. Um, especially if those folks can demonstrate how those skills like transfer, like that indicates to me like a, a level of self-awareness of like people who know what they're capable of, who know what they do and what they can bring to that campaign. Like there is a really, and, and this is changing, but there is a nasty habit of people sometimes in this industry, you know, looking at a resume, not seeing, you know, a congressional office on that resume and throwing it in the trash. And I think that is, absolutely to that person's detriment and to that office's detriment and to that organization's detriment. Um, so I would just really encourage anyone who's hiring campaign staff to be 
really mindful of, you know, what is this person's experience and how can that bring a different perspective than other applicants can to, you know, this campaign, this organization, this office, what have you. Awesome. That's such great advice. Sean or Dennis, anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with what Cal said, especially for, I mean, I think some people that work in the service industry, it's probably like a walk in the park to do uh, field work and to talk to voters after they go, they go uh, and work for 10 hours a day or so. It'd probably be like taking a break for them, if anything. Um, so yeah, I really agree with that. I guess I would say for hiring too, um, at least I feel like I feel like it's easier to take someone who's really motivated and believes in the campaign and to teach them the right skill sets than to take someone who has um, maybe a little bit of a better resume, but you feel like they might not be as committed. Maybe they're like testing the waters a little bit. Um, I, I feel like oftentimes in politics, there can be a lot of diamonds in the rough. They can be shined into very beautiful gems if you give them the opportunity to. I would also just add to that because Dennis pointed out like the, you know, people who've worked in the service industry. I've also said if I ever see someone with teaching on their resume, I'm hiring them immediately because like if you can put up with like primary education students, you can absolutely like work on a campaign and do literally anything. So I, you know, I was thinking about that as well as just like other jobs that I always like try and keep an eye out for, for people who can like literally a walk in the park for them. That's amazing. That's such a great point. <laughs> Sean, do you have anything to add? Okay. Um, I want to take a moment, especially because it is so much of the fabric of Staff Academy, to talk a little bit more about the importance of representative campaigns, both from a hiring perspective, but also for those uh, attendees that we have out tonight that are looking at Staff Academy. And, you know, as I said, we prioritize applicants and leaders that are women, people of color, and trans and non-binary people. Um, and that is a really important part of what Staff Academy is because we believe it is so crucial to have those representative campaigns and for our democratic ecosystem as a whole. So I'd love to hear from all of you just about um, your thoughts around the importance of that and, um, and also just speaking directly to some of those attendees out here tonight that are looking at that and are looking for an opportunity to really step up and what advice you would provide. Sean, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so I think I, I love what Cal said about, about fear and, and, and not being afraid. Um, and, you know, for every time that you think that something might not be right for you, there is a uh, probably a less qualified uh, person with more privilege that does not have that fear that can step into that role. Um, and, you know, I think I have seen personally, uh, we have a long way to go, but I have seen, um, you know, organizations campaigns become far more. Um, and when I say inclusive, I don't just mean like having bringing people into the room, but also supporting them and including them uh, during that process as well. So like, you know, if, if you are afraid of an opportunity because you think you might not, you know, that might not be the room for you, um, you know, I think, like Cal said, just just kind of go for it. And there's a lot of people out here who are, uh, you know, ready to welcome you and support you with open arms. Uh, there's plenty of, I think, you know, support both within our communities and in the in the, the um, you know world of democratic politics that you can find your people too uh, when when you get there. Cal, anything? Yeah, I something that Sean said at the tail end there was also something that I was thinking about of finding your people. Um, and this is something Dennis talked about earlier too, of, of kind of finding your friends in politics and, and using that as sort of a support system, especially for marginalized folk, people who have marginalized identities you have to like find your people because there are more of you like th there are people who have done this too who share experiences of yours share identities with you and y'all are likely experiencing very similar things and for nothing else just to have someone else who gets it that has been literally invaluable to me in doing this work because there is still so much growth that needs to happen and that unfortunately has to happen by like staff pushing for it to happen and usually it's staff that are affected by policies that aren't supporting them or workplaces that aren't safe for them and so i would really encourage folks to you know find 
other folks like them as a support system, but also remember that like there is power in numbers and there's power in that collective action and that having that space for you and for other people is a, it is a way to leverage your own power in this space um, and in these institutions and in, in these offices and campaigns to keep pushing um, everything in the direction that it needs to go. So um, I would say, you know, plus one to everything that Sean said, um, you know, don't be afraid, don't let that hold you back. There is someone with more privilege that is less qualified than you that has done this. So like encourage you to jump in and as you're jumping in or once you've jumped in, really work to find your people and hold them close and lean on one another because it, it can get really rough. Speaking from personal experience, like it can be rough to be a marginalized person in these spaces and you know, holding all kinds of identities and any number of identities. But um, I have really been able to find strength and power in leaning on, you know, my, you know, people that, that I can talk through those experiences with. Such powerful advice. That's great. Dennis, do you have anything to add? And then also, I'd love to hear your perspective from your experience in working um, with, you know, being on Staff Academy and uh, that community there and just sort of the, the uh, environment that a Staff Academy offers. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I don't have a whole lot uh, new to add on to to Sean and Cal. I feel like their answers were very succinct, succinct and perfectly stated. Um, I will just um, just add on again that it is infinitely easier if you have a group that you identify with and you're not doing this alone, um, because then it, it turns from kind of an exercise of almost being a martyr um, to being something where you're having fun in a way. I mean, it's still going to be like serious at times, but it's just, it's very different if you have a group of people that you feel safe and secure with and you're kind of doing this with together. Um, and yeah, don't be afraid. Um, believe in believe in yourself. If you think you might be uh, qualified for the role, you most likely are. Um, and as for my experiences with Staff Academy, um, at least from my, uh, from my viewpoint, I found it to be a very uh, welcoming community, the first batch. Um, I was, I, it seemed like we had a very diverse uh, representation of people. I'm sure we can always improve as most often can, um, but I, there were certainly a lot of, there were some um, non-binary people. We had um, the LBGTQ representation. We had a whole bunch of different um, people from different backgrounds. Uh, which I suppose I myself fit into since I'm kind of in the, the weird half area, half white, half a Hispanic, Native American. But I felt very, um, I felt very at home. And especially when we had our in-person DC um, conference for a few days, I was kind of surprised by how little toxicity there was. Uh, normally, I feel like when you get groups of people, I, maybe I was just fully insulated from this, but normally I feel like you usually get some drama, you get... Um, some some type of story that people are talking about and there was zero of that it was really like a nice uh wholesome community um and i was kind of i mean i i went in with like good expectations but i was surprised on like how friendly it was and everyone was um everyone was kind of on the same page and i've remained like good friends with a lot of the people from the academy when i started working at the d triple c uh, a fair amount of us were in dc and we'd get drinks regularly and kind of talk about our experiences at work um, but yeah, it, it was great and it felt like I was part of a new community. So um, if anyone is thinking about applying, I'd strongly recommend it. On a more tactical level, Dennis, I'd love to hear about how Staff Academy kind of changed your approach to the job search as a whole. Yeah, so the thing it really helped me with the most was that I had worked in some, some roles more as like a Swiss Army knife on campaigns before and I was trying to do a more serious switch to just digital work. Um, and the thing that really helped me with Staff Academy is it made the whole process not feel that nebulous anymore. It really kind of broke each task. Um, I especially found it really useful the, the um, weeks that we've kind of focused on like creating like content calendars and kind of organizing it um, and kind of reinforcing um, some Act Blue and um, NGP um, experience as well. And so I guess for me, it didn't like, it didn't change that much the type of jobs that I was applying to, but it made me feel very confident about the ones that I was applying to because I knew exactly what the role was going to entail. And I think that helped a lot and, and certainly played a, a factor in me being accepted the DCCC. 
Awesome. Thank you. That's super helpful. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat. I want to make sure we get to before we finish up. So one, Tyler has a question around campaign values and social norms and what some, what are some really great things you've seen campaigns to do to implement, um, uh, to implement some social norms, some values that really help their campaigns be a better place to work for staffers and make that be a more, uh, you know, safe, inclusive place that that really drives the campaign and their values. Uh, Cal, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I would say in terms of sort of like practices to remind people, you know, remind staff of those norms and those values and make sure that they're reinforced and kind of like at the top of mind all the time um, is writing them down and having them on display like in the office if you're in a physical office which i know not everyone is we are still in a pandemic and that is tricky to navigate um, but particularly in like field offices that is a practice that i think works really well and i think there are some ways to replicate that in more virtual environments for folks that may not be working in an office um, I think even, you know, restating those norms, the tops of meetings and that kind of thing is just like a constant reminder and like a reinforcement of those things. The other thing I would say is, and this is, you know, maybe more of a suggestion for leadership or a suggestion that folks should make to leadership of organizations um, or of campaigns or what have you, but to be really proactive in those norms and values and and move, moving away from being like reactive. So like as an example there, you know, I am someone who uses they them pronouns. I often like it is still not standard practice in a lot of places to encourage folks to state their pronouns, share their pronouns, put them in Zoom, you know, put them in email, all that stuff. And there have been times where I've had to be like the pronoun person who is like reminding folks of like, oh, we got to do pronouns. Like, let's not forget to do pronouns in introductions. And so like that is an opportunity where an organization or a campaign could be really proactive in that like instead of reacting to someone saying like we need to do this take some time and think proactively about like what are some some changes that we can make what are some policy policies that we can put in place to make our office our campaign our organization more welcoming and, and inclusive of folks because you know, with, with the pronoun example, like people who are trans or non-binary are more likely to want to come and work at your place if they feel like it's already ready for them, if they don't feel like they have to get it ready for themselves, right? Um, and have to be the ones to push things. So yeah, that would be my two pieces of advice, you know, write those, those values and norms down and have them on display in any way and every way that you can, and be really proactive about those norms and values and how you can really instill those um in your organization i love that make them actionable not just in words that's great advice anything else anyone has to add yeah i think as far as the like those stated values are concerned um they need to be specific enough to guide folks decisions mm -hmm. when there's not another person in the room otherwise they're functionally meaningless um the purpose of having those value systems in place is to help someone come in the door on the first day and say this is how we do things around here without having to read an entire, you know, handbook, right? So like, I agree with having them written down, having them reinforced, but also making them not so lofty that they're meaningless. So they should be able to guide your individual decisions as you go through your day. Um, because the folks who are most likely to not pay attention to those things will hide behind, well, I didn't understand what being innovative means, right? That's like, that's actually meaningless when you're, when you're dealing with, you know, interacting human to human. So they are really intended to, to kind of hold your, your, your mini society together long enough till you get to election day at least. Love it. Um, one more question and then we're gonna do a lightning round. Uh, uh, one attendee has a question around if she wants to, if they wanna work for a specific candidate, how can they get their attention and let them know that they're interested? Dennis, do you have any thoughts there? Yeah, so I definitely think it depends on the type of candidate that um, that this that this person is interested in working for. Um, if they're trying to work with Joe Biden, I think it might be a little tougher than if it's like a very local race. Um, I'll assume that this is like a more local or maybe like state level race, but not like, if it's not a massive, massive campaign, then I would just say to show up as soon as you can volunteer, get on their email list. 
Um, I'm sure you can find someone on their website to contact about volunteering or job offers, but just to like, like keep reaching out to them, show up to every event that they're doing. Um, odds are they will very quickly start to recognize your face and your name. And from there, I'm sure you can at least start to get some volunteer opportunities, which um, if you want to work for them directly, can oftentimes in the middle of a campaign turn into a more um, actual work role if uh, you're not able to be offered one right away. Awesome. That's super, super helpful. Okay. We are, this hour has flown by and there's been so much great advice on just across the spectrum of, uh, of campaign staffer things and looking at your career and how to get started and how to keep going. Um, so a lot of things, what I want to do is go around really quick and have you all send off all of our participants today with just like the one thing that they should turn around and do tomorrow that will really like small thing, big thing, turn around, start tomorrow that can bring their uh, their career forward or help them just really get going. So I will give you a second to think about it while I answer a few specific questions about Staff Academy. Um, if any, Ali has done a great job answering your questions in the Q&A box and in the chat. If you have remaining questions, there is an FAQ um, that is on our website that Ali can link to you. There's also a great blog post that I know that she has put in there as well that kind of divides out our different staff programs. We have our on-demand campaign staff courses, which might be the right choice. And then we have our Staff Academy, which again, applications open October 18th, and they're October 18th through October 31st when they close down. And that is your one opportunity for our 2022 cohort, which will launch at the beginning of the year. Um, so that cohort is really for folks who are interested in having a paid career or having a paid position on a campaign in 2022. Um, that's why the timing is that way. So, and we walk you through every step of the way of that application. So just as we've talked about here today, don't not apply because you're nervous that you don't don't have the experience or you don't have a resume. We even have a little mini lesson to help you build a resume um, or you, you know, don't have enough background. It doesn't matter. Like that's what we're here for is to give you that opportunity. And if you want to support your community, we want to support you to do it. So um, please join the wait list and you will be the first to be notified as well as get some tips along the way before applications open. And with that, Lightning round time. Um, so we're gonna go in reverse alphabetical order this time to end it off because that feels very full circle for me. So Sean, uh, let's start with you and then we will go around. Two things, one, apply to Staff Academy. Two, um, when I was trying to get started in, in politics, um, I basically did it in any anyone who would take me in any way, shape, manner, form volunteering. And it doesn't have to be uh, through candidates either. Just, I know this has been very candidate specific, but there's probably a local um, queer organization or immigrant rights organization, or you know, think a little bit outside of the world of, of just strictly electoral politics because they, they all need your help too. That's great. Dennis. Uh, yes, yeah, so I will also plug in Staff Academy and say apply to Staff Academy. Uh, outside of that, I would say to commit to by the end of next week, um, uh, sign up for one event or virtual event, depending on your comfort level with the pandemic and where you have to be living in the country. And one person that you're on that's either on a campaign or a part of a, a club that you're going to reach out to about getting more involved with uh, their particular organization. I feel like everything is very inertia based and kind of once you get the ball rolling, once you go to an event, once you reach out to someone, it's easier to keep doing that. And before you know it, you're uh, enmeshed into the political world. Nice. Cal, finish us off here. Yeah, in addition to applying to Staff Academy, um, I love a good vision board. So whether it is Google Docs, whether it is sticky notes on your wall, whatever, think through you know what it is, like whether it's types of roles, places you'd like to live, the types of candidates or races you'd be interested in, the issues that you're interested in. Put all of that information somewhere and really just take 15 minutes to write it all down, think about it, and go back to it frequently. Think about it as you're applying to jobs, as you're researching and thinking through what are, types, what are the types of positions that you're really interested in. Get something down on paper and use that as a reference point consistently. It'll really help you stay anchored during a process that can feel really chaotic um, and really give you something to reference back to. 
Oh, I love it. Thank you all so much. This has been the perfect combo of actionable tips and amazing inspiration. And we appreciate all of you. Um, and I know everyone that joined us here tonight does too. Thank you for your insight, your inspiration, your motivation, and, uh, and for being part of Staff Academy too. So thank you, everyone. Um, we hope to see you in a training soon. We hope you apply to Staff Academy. Have a great night. Hey everyone, my name is Jasmine Worlds and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm the advisor to the chief of staff of Shelby County Schools in Memphis, Tennessee. Go to traindemocrats.org for more political trainings just like this. Thank you so much for watching.